Good evening. Uh, hi. Welcome, everyone. My name is Abhishek Kekar. Uh, delighted to see this large crowd on a Monday, um, obviously, here for Raghu Karnat, who it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome. So uh, Raghu is, I don't think it's a horrible exaggeration to say that Raghu is probably one of India's most promising young journalists. Um, and has done really stellar work. <laughs> Young is very really problematic. Okay, middle age. All right, well done. Middle age, that's it. India is one of India's uh, foremost middle age journalists. <laughs> 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 But you know, Rahul, Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi is young, so I, I don't know. So I think Rahul is very young. Um, he's the he's the um, he's the author of the farthest field, an Indian story of the Second World War, um, which was shortlisted for the Hessel Chilkman Prize in 2016. He also won the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar in the same year. You still you still have that Puraskar? Or? I Somewhere? Think. Yeah. Okay. For a word drops. I see. Okay, um, so Raghu, but also we, I think all of us, many of us in this room might know Raghu from The Wire, which is a really remarkable website and a really remarkable media portal. And those of you who have not had the experience or ever checked it out should absolutely check it out because we now live in a strange world where the so-called major newspapers in India do not appear to be giving us the information that we believe you know, is the job of a free press. And it is organizations such as The Wire, um, and especially with his own reporting, where you begin to see um, very seriously the kinds of distortions which are beginning to affect Indian democracy. And also the really important and powerful ways in which small grassroots organizations, publicly funded by donations only from Indian citizens, um, are nonetheless being able to do some of the work that we expect from the media and journalism. So, you know, without saying too much more, I think we're going to learn a great deal from Raghu today about reporting this latest election. Um, I'm delighted that you're here. Thank you so much for coming, and please join me in welcoming him. Thank you all for making it. I'm really honored. Now, the last time that I was here in Berkeley, I was <clears throat> giving a talk about a subject that I had much more firmly in hand. I could even call myself an expert on it. It was about India in the Second World War. <laughs> this time, it's sort of the opposite, I'm afraid. I'm going to try and talk about uh, things that I, what I believe are the failures of our understanding at the end of, um, of an extremely major and, uh, and you know, and, and sort of paradigmatic uh, election, um, what it is that we have, uh, that, we, that, we, that we failed, the questions we failed to answer and, um, and the matters that remain out of sight, partly by design and partly because of the limitations of our approach as journalists and as analysts and sometimes as scholars. So um, essentially, I was the chief of bureau at The Wire and running the newsroom there from the end of last year until the conclusion of the elections in June, and um, was amazed and overwhelmed by the speed of events. I was looking forward to the conclusion of the elections and all of the very careful analysis and trenchant uh, investigation that would follow. Now, I don't know if you guys saw any of that, but I did not. Um, just if there's anyone here who is not familiar with the ele with Indian politics or what happened in this election, I can quickly recap it. But um, no, yes. The, in, in very short, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who leads the Bharatiya Janata Party, um, and who won a historic mandate in 2014 by forming the first majority government for his party first majority government that uh, went to a single party that was not the Congress party, uh, was expected to not perform as well because of the indicators and, um, and the news from the ground about how the economy and, and, and the welfare of people had, uh, had fared under his election. To give a very brief um, glimpse into some of that, the Indian government was adding something like um, one tenth the number of jobs every year that it required to uh, to accommodate the number of young people who are entering the job market. Uh, a suppressed report, which I'm sure many of you heard about, uh, from a statistical institute said that uh, that India was at a that unemployment in India was at a 45-year high. Um, but uh, that report was suppressed 
forced the chairperson of that institute to, to resign, and it was only released a week after the election results. Um, in short, nobody really thinks the economy or the agrarian situation, which are you know, two essential factors in, one would think, political performance, uh, were doing well. And yet, in 2019, sorry you have to read this the wrong way around, blame the BBC. Uh, <laughs> In 2019, the mandate that Narendra Modi's government won only increased, expanded to new regions. Um, uh, his majority in parliament, his party's majority in parliament, climbed from the upper 200s across the 300 line. And um, we were left with only some very inadequate and I would say fallacious arguments about why that, was, that, that had happened. That was as far as the news and the media took us. Um, and part of what I've been trying to get myself to do is to, um, is to focus on, on, on is to take the time to, to, to process and uh, consolidate my thesis about what are essential processes that took place in 2019 and what they mean about what is likely to happen in 2024 and in Indian elections ahead of us. So, let me begin. Now, the very simple and kind of um, the basic blind alley that uh, most Indian news media headed down after the election was to describe the 2019 election as a victory of storytelling. I'm sure you all heard variations of this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But uh, even within this framework, there are different levels of kind of superficiality. There are a lot of explanations among them. Not, they're, not all, they're not all wrong, but in my opinion they all conceal more than they reveal. Among them that Modi, it was a factor of Modi's charisma and his natural appeal to, um, to, in, to the Indian electorate, or that it was a factor principally of the appeal of the BJP's ideology, its nationalist narrative, um, the force of the spirit that it commanded out of, Indian, out of Indians, or Modi's clout, his clout in the media, in, on social media, and his kind of deft and skillful use of all the available platforms and, um, and tools in the media to reach the Indian electorate. Now that last bit is correct, of course, the BJP did dominate um, the, the news media as well as social media and other forms, and, in, and it kind of co-opted areas of media that we're not used to seeing politics uh, kind of um, show up in, including entertainment. Uh, in the last year, I'm sure you saw, some of you have seen this photograph. In case you don't know who those people are, that's Prime Minister Modi in the center. And around him are the only people in the country who could compete with him for <laughs> visibility or fame. The, that's the kind of A-list of, uh, of the Bombay film industry. And this is a, a selfie that appeared with very little explanation earlier this year, and was just part of a deluge of somewhat unaccountable um, entertainment imagery and visuals that, 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 that kind of produced a sort of synergy of publicity between the Prime Minister's office and, uh, and various celebrities. This is, you know, this is fair game. The Modi tapped into something and real, and and realized that there was a way to scale up publicity and to, and to reach the, into the attention spans of people who weren't interested in politics. And he did that through, um, through a variety of what you could call collaborations, through, tweet, through TV shows and through uh, feature films and through s celebrity sort of interactions, um, such as with Akshay Kumar and with Instagram influencers and so on and so forth. Uri was a notable example because it was the most successful Bollywood blockbuster of uh, the past five years and also one that was about a particular contemporary military event that was a sort of masthead accomplishment of the, of the government and it featured the Prime Minister and his National Security Advisor in the film and it produced a kind of motto, a very aggressive motto that then got used by the BJP and echoed in Parliament and so on. And uh, to make quick work of this section, because I'm sure you guys have uh, understand my drift, uh, the last thing that I'll come to in terms of touching on Modi's deft use of media platforms is Namo TV. 
Anyone, did Namo TV cross anyone's radar? Anyone here unaware of Namo TV? Namo stands for Narendra Modi, it's his popular nickname. And at some point, about a week before the first phase of voting in the election, every cable, private cable provider in the country um, was suddenly broadcasting a new channel. It was called Namo TV. And it was a 24-7 running broadcast of the Prime Minister's speeches and his fireside chats, his yoga instructional videos, and other propaganda um, on a continuous stream, but uh, with no explanation about who owned or was operating this channel. Every, uh, every cable operator had a different, ex di different explanation for what category this channel fell in, whether it was a news channel, whether it was an advertising channel, whether it was a... Um, a kind of platformed feature that, that um, and it was a few weeks before it was before the BJP was even forced to confess that they were in fact operating it themselves and they were operating it with no licenses and no regulations and therefore literally in contravention of some important national security <laughs> laws that have to do with uplink and downlink from satellites and it was, uh, it was some wire investigations that helped to establish that. Yet, Namo TV continued to run on every single private cable connection in the country through the election season, and was only shut down by the election commission uh, a couple of days before the final uh, voting phase. So, I just want you to, uh, I want you to be aware of Namo TV because we will come back to that, and I think that uh, it'll have that if we won't, it, 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 it disappeared and hasn't been heard of or from since then, but I don't think we've seen the last of it. So, a better framework than the kind of victory of storytelling framework is, um, is what I call the network thesis. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm just kind of freestyling here, so if anyone has any questions or would like to interject, you're more than welcome. And I'm moving, I think, a lot, possibly across a lot of ideas. So if something's unclear, please just do let me know. Now, the network thesis is a good explanation, uh, but to my mind, still an inadequate one. And this is where the more professional news analysis and critique of the election got. Uh, the, 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 there were um, pieces of this, very important pieces of this, advanced by some good newspapers, such as the Indian Express and Caravan and the Huffington Post in India. Um, and what they gave us was a sort of piecemeal picture of, uh, of, this, of, of how the campaign was operating, but I don't think that uh, we've taken it far enough. What's the network thesis? The network thesis is essentially that various agencies and institutions and private forms of media worked um, with, rel with remarkably little friction on a kind of centrally coordinated campaign to uh, sort of to distribute BJP uh, propaganda and the and its electoral publicity, and it comprises and so this network comprises both familiar old um, elements and then some relatively new ones. Um, but uh, but but again, I. I don't think the reporting has, has, has gone far enough in helping us understand just what this network looks like. So the old ones are government ministries, center and state, state agencies, including the, um, the CBI, Central Bureau of Investigation, the Reserve Bank of India, the, um, the IT department, and other autonomous institutions which were clearly, which are meant to work as checks on the power of the incumbent government to use the state uh, in its re-election campaign, but those autonomous institutions were not doing their job. And the most obvious one there is the election commission. So we've seen variations of this in elections past. This is not like, this is not something radically new that, that, the, that the Modi PMO did relatively new set of elements that were working as part of this thesis and to, I mean as part of this network were political consultancies and the use of integrated databases. Now what I mean by integrated databases is that India's um, both the state through the through the Aadhaar most obviously 
but also through a variety of other welfare schemes and at, at other levels. It's collecting sort of um, databases on the Indian electorate. There are also private databases that the BJP itself is compiling and that it's purchasing from um, sort of uh, from corporate or like from, from, from private companies. Uh, and a new element, so, so those exist and they're all at the service and they're clearly being used very adeptly by the BJP and by, by the BJP in its capacity as the incumbent government. They're also being used by some non-BJP state governments, including in Andhra Pradesh and elsewhere. And, and working on that data are some very uh, uh, well-funded and powerfully staffed political consultancies, which are kind of a new element in the mix of Indian, in, of Indian politics. They've taken over a lot of the jobs that were or the tasks that were traditionally the work of political party cadre in terms of uh, of, be, of it being their job to understand um, uh, the constituencies and the voting booths and the lay of the land and the uh, and the electorate in those places political consultancies are incre increasingly stepping in and using what they can find from databases rather than what cadre find from being on the ground to design messages, messaging, and then to target um, target that messaging at the electorate. Fine. It's still, this is still broadly legal, except probably in terms of how these databases are being used. And an important new element then is how is, is uh, reaching voters on their smartphones. And this is going to be, uh, I think, the, this, this smartphone revolution, of which I'm sure you all seen much and experienced yourself in India, uh, I think that is the centerpiece of what we fail to understand, but which the government, the Indian government, does understand the power of. And that's what I'm going to, ex that's what I'm going to try and kind of delve into. Um, but uh, for now, within our kind of, or within the kind of pub, like available uh, explanations in the media, of, uh, of, of how this campaign was run and how this victory was won. Um, the, the, uh, a, key, a key piece is the fact that more and more Indians, hundreds of millions of Indians now have a smartphone on which the government can individually reach them. And this is a game changer for, for elections and for politics. In 2014, you may remember there was a lot of talk that about how social media was a game changer in winning Modi his victory. His use of social media, Twitter and Facebook and so on, was allowing him to broadcast to voters uh, that people were not were not reaching as effectively before, right? But two th 2019 has taken that one step forward. So in the new iteration, where social media allows you to broadcast to voters, smartphones and WhatsApp allow you to deliver individual messages to target individual messages to individual voters. Um, so rather, th so that making it that much more effective. So essentially what we've got going on is that the collusion of a variety of state institutions and agencies providing data to very expensively run and uh, private consultancies that then um, sort of deploy messaging across across the mobile phone network and use WhatsApp especially to, um, to, to drum up support for the BJP is, 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 is the best kind of deep reaching explanation that's been available of the election result since June, right? And there's, there's some, a very good example of that was a series in the Indian Express that came out that explored how um, the BJP had call centers um, designated across the country that had access to these databases, knew what each um, what each government welfare knew had a full list of every government welfare uh, recipients of every government welfare scheme, their phone numbers and their profiles because this 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 was information that was compiled from different kinds of databases, and then could make calls and send them messages individually with, uh, with 
well-targeted information. So you get the picture. So this is why 2019 was often sometimes uh, called India's WhatsApp election while it was going on and afterwards. So it's very clear that use, the use of WhatsApp, not just for fake news and aggressive kind of um, divisive messaging, but also for more legitimate campaign messages was essential. So I think one thing is missing here. This is a, okay. Yeah. Uh, the the fundamental part of uh, the Hindu nationalism through sadhus and all that. There was also part of that network. Yeah, but I think that you know the thing is I think that's been part of the I think that's been part of the sung campaigning for for uh, at least twenty years. So I don't think that that's a a new thing in two thousand and nineteen. They've been using the VHP to penetrate the Sadhu networks for a long time. But we can come back to that. I think it's, it's important. Um, but I'll just, I'll just read you a quick couple of lines from Arundhati Roy, who, you know, always sounds like she's paranoid and then ends up turning out to have her eye exactly on the ball. Um, and this, so this is her description of this situation. She's like, uh, this is from an interview in The Guardian, I think. She said, that money bought them tens of thousands of IT experts, data analysts, social media activists who ran thousands of WhatsApp groups with carefully directed propaganda, tailored and tweaked for every section, region, caste, and class, every voting booth in every constituency. So I think that basically, that basically sums up a pretty good deep-reaching analysis of 2019, but still, in my view, not a complete one. So, yeah, what I'm trying to understand and what I'm trying to sort of uh, to penetrate because it's both outside of my field and, as I said, deliberately obscured is what, I, for my, I'm, what I'm calling for myself uh, a pattern of hidden, hidden hegemony. And to understand how this is unfolding, we kind of need to understand a bit more about this smartphone revolution. So. Uh, the growth, the expansion of India's mobile telecom um, network is absolutely historic and remarkable. It's leapfrog, you know, it's been, it's been in process for about two decades, so this is not new. What's new is that it's, is, this is now, t it's, this is no longer just uh, 2G cell phones, it's now 4G cell phones. This, these are people who don't just have cell phones that can make and receive calls and messages, but people who have access to the internet. Um, and these smartphones have leapfrogged over the penetration into many parts of India of other kinds of media, of newspapers and even of television in some places, because some of these places are off the electrical grid. So what, uh, what is sometimes called media dark regions, in media dark regions, people's first encounter with electronic media has been, thanks. Has been, minutes, perfect. Um, has been mobile phones and mobile internet, and uh, for a variety of reasons that you will that, that I'll explain, um, India is now providing. Indian mobile networks are providing mobile internet more effectively than almost any other country in the world. They we have the cheapest mobile data prices in the. Uh, in the world, um, and as of this year, the average Indian uh, phone user was using three times as much mobile data as the average American, which I think is quite remarkable. We're talking about an enormous surfeit of uh, of information of, of electronic media. Uh, made available to people who don't really have a surfeit of much else, you know, if people who are still living in regions where they're likely to be malnourished and not uh, receiving proper education. But um, so yeah, something like nine or ten gigabytes of internet per Indian per month. So something really remarkable is going on, and uh, people have we sort of failed to grasp both the significance of both how that's happened and. Uh, the fact that that's happened. Now, so it should be obviously worth celebrating. We think about the internet as being a kind of new sort of um, an amenity that's like a civic right um, and a developmental kind of asset as well. So the expansion of mobile access and internet access across these huge swaths of India should be 
both worth celebrating for its developmental value and also I, one would think for its democratic value because you know this is <coughs> this is the internet anyone can can get in there and and have their say and the users can also access they can act, they can read the wire if they choose to um, so what's the problem that's what I'm that that's that's what I'm trying to explore now I guess you guys have already read this so but I'll just read it my my theory or my belief is that what we're failing to see isn't just that the the internet exists in the way we perceive it and that the government is using uh, that those platforms very effectively but that the internet is actually expanding and it's both at the level of infrastructure and at the level of software and hardware it is a new architecture is being formed it's being formed as a kind of as part of India's developmental mission and uh, the way that architecture is being built is has, is being set, is you know is is um, laying a foundation for a new level of political political hegemony and the best way to explain that is through two contrary two parallel developments okay one of them is the namo app do i have a picture of the namo app no but the namo app is again namo narendra modi his uh, his personal app it was introduced in 2016 uh, it was a bit jerry-rigged in the beginning, but it's become quite sophisticated. And it does all kinds of things. It's really fun. It's a news app. It's a, it's a merchandise marketplace. It allows you to make donations. It allows you to fill in surveys. It allows you to send feedback to your local kind of um, party workers. Um, and it allows you, most importantly, to stream all of the Prime Minister's speeches and his uh, and his monkey bath program and so on. And it also includes something called My Network, which is the social area within the Namo app. It works something like Twitter. And people who sign on to the Namo app are automatically entered into My Network and subscribed to various news sources. Among those news sources are unofficial pro-BJP groups, which means that a lot of what gets streamed into the Namo app and into my network is unfortunately uh, very uh, provocative fake news or very kind of incendiary hate speech. So I'll just give you an example. I'm afraid this is a slightly uh, kind of violent message, so please prepare yourself. Uh, this is one example from a piece on the Huffington Post. This was on the Namo app. Of the total of 40,000 rape cases in India in the last 10 years, 39,000 had a Muslim rapist. Still, Congress and Rahul Gandhi say that the Hindus are rapists and terrorists. Shame on Congress and the Gandhi family. So, I mean, there's nothing especially remarkable about this, or, or like especially outstanding about this message, except that it appeared under the heading of being news on the Prime Minister's own app. So there's a real problem there. But this gives you, uh, oh, and, and then this gives you a picture of, 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 uh, of what the Namo app is kind of, can, can be, it's permeable to. And what's most interesting about it is that the, is that the, way, the functioning of the app is increasing, increasingly kind of gamified uh, to drive engagement and to incentivize people using it and getting other people to use it. So you accumulate points um, by getting other people to use it, by participating, and as you accumulate points, I think you kind of level up, and then you're enrolled for certain kinds of rewards, and eventually the really enthusiastic uh, users of the Namo app get to meet Narendra Modi himself. Mm -hmm. you have a question? How many users are there? Okay, so uh, there are, I think that if you go on the Google Marketplace, then there are something like 10 or 15 million downloads there, which is not much. But as you'll see, there's a different route for distributing the Namo app, which is much more significant. So that's the Namo app. That's piece one. Sorry, yeah, you got so the information like 39,000 or 40,000. Is that inaccurate and taken type of thing, or is it or just biased to their advantage? Yeah, it's completely, uh, it, it's completely outrageously wrong. Yes. Starting with the starting with the idea that they're 
40,000 rape cases registered in India over the last 10, 10 years, which is also wrong. But um, there's also no religious profile. And, and it still goes. Such news still go. Yeah, it goes. So like this is the kind of thing that you would see that you would see on a WhatsApp and not even be especially surprised. But um, but this is I'm just trying to give you a sense of, of, of what gets passed off on the Namo app as news sometimes. So it's actually very much so. Yes. The second part of this puzzle is Reliance Geo. Now Reliance Geo is I think one of the one of the biggest tech and corporate stories in the world right now, which people aren't quite appreciating. It is a mobile telephone network started by Reliance Industries, uh, which is India's largest industrial conglomerate, run by India's richest man, Mukesh Ambani. And it was launched in 2016, so that it was a very new entrant into a market, into a mobile kind of market that was already very, that, that, that had like more than a dozen competitors, many of them had been in the business for decades, um, and that were already serving a very large, you know, uh, a very large population quite well. So it seemed uh, like it was just a, it, it was presented as sort of like a scrappy startup and began with those, with some, with some advantages given to it under that um, pretext. This was, this was the launch of Reliance Geo. For some reason it had the Prime Minister uh, the Prime Minister's face right front and center of its front page ads. They eventually had to apologize for that. Um, but it was actually quite appropriate, as we'll see. What, what Geo did was it began almost immediately a price war and caused the price of, the, of 4G data to plunge across the country. It dropped by something like 94%. Um, uh, at its launch, Data was free for all Geo customers. Very soon after that, um, it introduced pricing, but the price is something as low as five cents per gigabyte. So we begin to have the cheapest rate in the world, and this forces other companies in the same uh, in the same industry to try and compete at those at those rates. Um, and it's put the entire industry very deeply in the red. But the Reliance Group more largely is subsidizing Reliance Geo. Reliance Geo is also like a very heavily amortized company. And, um, and it has used this price war not only to reduce the competition in the market from over a dozen players to now three, and soon it may be two, but it has also grown at an absolutely spectacular rate. Um, Within the first six months, Reliance Geo went from zero to a hundred million clients. In May of this year, it became the second largest mobile telecom provider in the country. In August of this year, it became the largest. So that's from 2016 to 2019. It's moved from zero to absolute dominance, <coughs> or to emerging dominance, and what may soon be um, a kind of monopolistic situation. The only people who are worried about this for some reason are the financial papers. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, reason, it's pretty obvious why they're worried about it is because they, um, they don't want to see um, a monopoly open up in this very important industry based on unsustainable pricing that will eventually rebound. Um, but, uh, but, this, but people, it hasn't quite penetrated more widely that, that Geo is causing this kind of huge transformation to this crucial industry. This is a, this is a story in the caravan that detailed very carefully um, all the series of, um, of regulatory omissions that the government made in order to allow and encourage GEO to grow at this speed. India has a telecom regulatory authority. It has a bunch of uh, of, of rules and laws that provide anti-competitive measures that are supposed to stop and check the emergence of a monopoly, just like this one. And one by one, they were all sort of pushed to the side to allow Geo through. It's, a very, it's an excellent investigation. I fear that almost nobody read it. Um, but it's in there in case anyone wants to investigate the nuts and bolts of Geo's growth from a regulatory perspective. Oops. 
So here's Mukesh Ambani talking about uh, about his ambitions. He, uh, they now have 340 million users and soon hope to have half a billion. <coughs> so that's uh, that's this major new force in uh, in the media and in communication in India. And in 2016, in 2017. Geo did something equally interesting, which is that it introduced the Geo Four. Um, so, I mean, just to sort of put this in context and to kind of complicate this a little bit, while this is very troubling and obviously kind of uh, it's a, a sort of alarming emergence of a monopoly that's tied to all kinds of interests and 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 will and will sort of have a kind of veto power over all kinds of um, of communication in India. It's because of this price war instigated by Geo that uh, mobile internet use has spread as quickly to as many Indians as it has. So if any of you are aware of the competition between T-Series, the music publisher, and PewDiePie, the Swedish blogger, to become the YouTube account with the most subscribers in the world, T-Series has won. And the reason it's one is for this, is, is for this reason. There are, um, uh, this is both an alarming emerging monopoly, but it also, uh, and, and this is also a kind of alibi that it provides, it is also serving many, many millions of Indians due to these uh, slashed prices. So, coming back to the Geo Phone, I would love to show you a video of the launch of the Geo Phone, which took place in 2017 because uh, it's on YouTube, look it up, it speaks for itself in many ways. Akash Ambani, who is Mukesh Ambani's son, was presenting to shareholders, was talking about the geophone and its many, uh, it, its many features. It's a smartphone, obviously, um, but again, radically low prices. Uh, this, this Diwali, they're offering, there's a special offer on geophones, you can get one for $10. Um, but it's a smartphone with all kinds of capabilities. And to demonstrate these capabilities, he used a voice activation function and he said, Geo, play the latest monkey bath. And, and to the cheers uh, and the sloganeering in the crowd, who were all shouting, Bharat Mata Ki Jai, it played the latest episode of the Prime Minister's Fireside Chat. And then it was revealed that um, every Geo phone would come preloaded <coughs> with the Namo app. So, yeah, give me give me one second. So I think what you can see here is the beginning of a kind of uh, the the closing of a loop between how the government is allowing infrastructure, new digital infrastructure, to expand in the country, um, which corporations it's allowing to take ownership of uh, or, or even to sort of to dominate uh, the market in that new uh, digital infrastructure and how those corporations are then paying back uh, by providing direct channels for the government, for example, the Namo app to all of the users on that infrastructure. So, yeah. And what proportion of the geo customer base uses geo phones as opposed to their own phone? Good question. Um, that's I don't actually know that number. It's probably, what I do know is, so Geo expanded very rapidly even before the Geophone came out. The Geophone came out in 2017 in the summer. Um, as of, uh, as of a, earlier this year, there were about 80 million Geophones in use, or had been sold. And as of last month or this month, the Geophone was the number one brand handset being sold in the country. So, I don't know, somehow in India the number 80 million can sound like not very much, <laughs> but, uh, but it'd be very kind of short-sighted to see it that way because all of this has just happened within the last year or two. Like, we, we're just at the outset of some massive transformation and, yeah, that's... Sir, uh, electrical apprehension is in, in, in many of the Indian is 
that uh, you and uh, other such groups have used the BSNL, the merged BSNL, MTN network, optical fiber base, and transmission logger. What yeah. is the, uh, could you give the clarity about that? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's uh, absolutely true. The BSNL, which is the government's, um, the, the state-owned mobile telecom company, has been shrinking and laying off large numbers of employees who are um, who are the most outspoken at the moment. The BSNL Employees Union is the most outspoken body about the threat of Geo's uh, monopoly because it is, according to them, uh, their their kind of public sector uh, operation is being gutted to allow Geo to expand in those markets. But did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, from a legal perspective when you're talking about now on TV during election time or mm -hmm. uh, the Prime Minister appearing on corporate uh, advertisements like with KTM or with Geo. Yeah. Like what is the legal perspective on this? Is it legal? Uh, how is he able to? How is it? How can he circumvent? I guess the law. Or, like what is? So I think that, yeah, that, I mean, important question. I'm slightly out of my depth on that because I think that you could kind of dispute various points. Namo TV was, was, was illegal in the sense that there were a series of regulations and licenses that you need to, uh, to obtain in order to have a ch have to, to broadcast, especially if you're broadcasting through a satellite. None of those existed. They literally did not have any regulations that anyone could provide. So essentially, it's something just slipped through the home, through the home ministry, and uh, and I would say the Namo TV was 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 just a kind of beta test that that, that was being conducted. Would it be a fair analogy to say that Geo wants to be say the Alibaba or Tencent to India's? Can to can you hold that and sure, and, and ask exactly that at the end of this because I think that's really important. Anyway, uh, the government is 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 allowing Geo to expand. Uh, very rapidly, the geophone is a key piece of the new architecture of digital India and India's kind of digital development, and it is also um, it is also carrying the um, is also carrying the Namo app and uh, and essentially providing a direct channel for the government and for the prime minister, a direct and and very sophisticated channel to the to the Indian electorate. So this is the level of the architecture that I am that I am thinking of as being designed to produce a hidden hegemony, because it is uh, it is technical. Doesn't invite a lot of attention from political analysts and from journalists, and um, and for various reasons, uh, the way that that this kind of messaging operates is not is is a little bit is. It's harder to see. You can't step outside, or you can't step outside your news stand and pick up a newspaper. You can't turn on TV and see what's happening on Republic, both of which might be alarming enough. Um, this is a new uh, and sort of uh, this, this sort of a new system in which in which the messaging and the hegemony that's being established is being established with uh, direct and individual connections between um, power centers mm -hmm. which are fairly on high and Indian voters and and citizens uh, who are you know who may be anywhere in the country one of them has been awarded with Padal Bhushan also yeah it is India to get uh, that will so, I, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. so sorry can we just say questions for the answer yeah so I'm nearly I'm just about oh, done yeah. so there's just a couple so there's just a couple of um, uh, there's a couple of as this is sort of takeaways from this uh, from this framework or this idea of the hidden hegemony that I am thinking about. One is, uh, to my mind, India is the kind of perfect storm. I don't think that this is a, this is a phenomenon that's going to be restricted to India by any means. Uh, I think that one of the reasons that it is worth talking about in the States is that we're going to see forms of this replicated um, across the world. And India is the perfect storm for a couple of reasons. Um, it's, it's worth watching as the perfect storm for a couple of reasons. One, it's a pretty mature democracy. It has functioning and well understood electoral norms. And it, there are elections happening all the time. 
which means that there are both controls that we can use to study, and also that these techniques can be refined, these kind of, uh, this technical architecture can be sort of tested on a new election every couple of months, because state elections are, you know, feel like they're almost continuous in the country. Um, the second reason is that uh, unlike I, perhaps in developed countries, the uh, many, much of the Indian electorate is going from being somewhat uh, deprived of media, especially electronic media, to being saturated with it. And so we're seeing people who um, may be very sophisticated voters, but are probably not sophisticated in terms of having a range of of, of kind of contrary, uh, counter sources of information or, uh, or, or a training and a literacy in how to read the media. Um, so in that sense, you might call them neo-literate or naive about, uh, about this kind of media. And there's a massive expansion of, uh, of this kind of penetration, both of the internet and of, the, of, of this kind of messaging among those Indians. The third is that there's just a huge surplus of, of IT and engineering personnel, and that's only going to increase. <laughs> and the fourth is that there is is that the databases that are being created in India about, uh, of, you know, databases about the electorate and are, are are both massive, and Aadhaar is is easily the best example, but they're also unsecure. <laughs> and the fact that they're being used for political purposes with very little. Um, kind of with very few checks and balances is, you know, is a serious issue. Um, the second point is we need to kind of understand uh, if, if we're to analyze these, uh, that these are all, that these are moving targets. So this is, that's this kind of the problem. My, in my experience, every election we, we are using a technical, you know, kind of technological framework from the last election that's already somewhat out of date. So, the fact that no one has really explored the impact of Reliance Geo and these um, and, and, and this access to tens or hundreds of millions of Indian voters in the context of the 2019 election, to me that's very troubling. We're still talking about what what uh, you know where where analysts are really trailing what the government and political parties are doing in terms of 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 campaign engineering and, and how campaign machines run. Um, the main uh, the main kind of new iteration that I'm trying to describe here is one in which <clears throat> many of you will be familiar with Cambridge Analytica and the and, 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 and what it's meant to represent in the future of electoral politics. Essentially that on a platform like Facebook, apps can scoop up all of this data and then use it to target users uh, with, you know, with <coughs> political messaging, um, and that that can have a very serious impact on electoral outcomes. What I'm thinking of as Cambridge Analytica 2.0 is where that happens, but without Facebook as the intermediary, mm. right? What happens when a country in this case, India can develop, uh, you know, a new expansion of of its uh, of its digital infrastructure and its platforms, and it doesn't have Mark Zuckerberg or Jack as you know providing whatever level of checks and balances or friction that they currently do because uh, because they sit in Silicon Valley. So it, we may be looking at a future in which we look back with fondness at the role. <laughs> of Zuckerberg and Jack um, in, um, in mediating uh, how technology is used by politicians. Uh, so, yeah, so we, so we, need, we need to put a lot of work into kind of in, in, into, into, into talking to people who help us understand where, you know, uh, where these uh, where these kind of technological processes are heading, so that we can uh, we can be ahead of them instead of instead of behind uh, instead of behind them in, in terms of how they're using. It's, I'm sorry, instead of how they're working. Uh, 
And the third is, uh, is, is just a thought I've been having, which is that in the current, uh, in the current te technological ecosystem where we've become accustomed to the idea of massive disruptions that can, that can grow a company or can, or can grow a platform from zero to half a billion users, and uh, we're no longer suspicious or particularly skeptical of that uh, because we are happy to attri attribute this to innovation and change, and, and that's the disruption, and that's what we call disruption. But I think we need to be very alert to the fact that um, that disruption can be an alibi uh, and may increasingly be an alibi as governments try to use, as governments use their power and their ability to redesign, um, uh, to redistribute uh, power within kind of uh, these industries to uh, obtain a new kind of hegemony. Mm -hmm. So that is my presentation about 2019, what I think are sort of hidden factors and structural transformations uh, that have already begun to take place and that were a very serious kind of um, a kind of factor in 2019 and will be more serious, become an increasingly more serious factor in 2024 mm -hmm. and in the elections ahead. And I'm really glad to be talking about that in Berkeley because I'm hoping that uh, the combination of social scientists and maybe some tech, uh, some people who work in tech will be able to correct me or or improve my uh, my understanding of this picture. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So thank you very much for that fascinating presentation. I have lots of questions. Um, I'll ask you a couple. But before I ask you my questions, can I simply can I you know, open the floor a little bit to your questions? I just want to make a little plea because time is somewhat limited. It would be really nice if you sort of sharpened your question into a nice fine point before you prod it or move it. Yes, gentlemen in the back. Um, okay. uh, that was nice. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you kind of painted a nice picture of like the infrastructure of how information is flowing right now. Mm -hmm. like, who are kind of main actors? I think what I kind of always struggle with is understanding is how do you how do you work within the system and bring voices like ours into that system as well. So why do you have the 30,000 versus 40,000 articles uh, that are just you know, sort of spreading propaganda? How do you also communicate something that's as simple as like, and like gender sensitivity or the ability to be empathetic while having a discourse about uh, religious differences? Because that's something that's like quite crucial but also restricted in English in most cases and like communicating that in Hindi or other regional languages. It gets like pretty complex. Okay, well, I, I mean, the in, in a sense, as someone who is part of the team at the Wire, trying to figure that out is uh, is is part of our job, and there's no there's no obvious sort of solution to that problem. I think the part of what I'm trying to describe here is uh, is is that is the fact that you can have what's still technically an, an open information ecosystem. Uh, digital and non-digital, but you can still expand the uh, the kind of dominance of of party of ruling party propaganda within that, um, and all the other valuable kinds of messaging that um, uh, that the country that, that a society needs uh, may receive some space <laughs> or may not. I mean, like uh, arguably the the BJP's provided a lot of space for for messaging about women's menstrual health or about uh, hygiene and things like that but um, ultimately this I mean I, I uh, it, it depends the the, the the larger problem is is even understanding the extent to which uh, the government is establishing kind of uh, degrees of control that didn't exist before I like to follow up question sorry uh, can we just yeah, sir, uh, my name is Raju. Uh, you referenced the other several times yeah. in your talk. Yeah. Kind of hits close to home because I work for the other project. Oh, great. Traditional stages. And uh, I have a technical question. Um, when you talked about the, the government's ability to access the other database, yeah. 
are you saying that the whole idea that we, as other people, define as a black box that can never be accessed by anybody else in the government is a myth? Or are you referencing the fact that once Aadhaar gets seeded into other databases, like the Election Commission is now pushing hard to seed Aadhaar, uh, so have you gotten to the level where you are able to see if government organizations are actually accessing the Aadhaar central database mm -hmm. for their political purposes? Or are you talking in general about seeding of other databases with Aadhaar? I, I quite honestly can't provide you with a sufficiently kind of um, refined answer to that. I do know that um, I do know that political consultancies in in uh, in a lot of state elections are increasingly gaining access to um, to databases that include other numbers that include other numbers, phone numbers, and uh, and I don't know how what what they can use in terms of. Uh, having that those other numbers to uh, to complete the profile of the individuals that they are targeting. But do you do you have do you have a sense? Do you, do you, is your feeling that that black box is intact? My feeling is the, uh, the black box is still intact, especially after the intervention of the Supreme Court to lay out some ground rules on privacy. But I feel very suspicious about the long delay in the government coming out with a privacy law, yeah. which they have been promising, and that makes me very paranoid that one day even that so-called black box might be accessed. Right. Mm -hmm. But right. as far as breaches are concerned, what you reference, uh, the feeder systems into the other, like in Jharkhand, for example, uh, where they leaked information which had other information, other numbers and others, uh, I don't think it's part of a political uh, act as as much as a bureaucratic faux pas mm -hmm. in those cases. Well, I mean, the bureaucratic faux pas can be very useful when you yes. want that information. And I think that the, the no holds barred approach of the BJP in campaigns means that one really has to assume that they're using all the tools that can be accessed, whether legally or illegally. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, I just have a perspective to add. Uh, yes, please. I mean, I think uh, your point, your point where you're talking about the engineering of, uh, I guess, the campaign is very important. But I think also just the sheer quantum of advertising money that's going. Yes, It's thank just you for the that. quantity. I mean, uh, I guess he's very creative with, uh, I guess, just the quantity because you had the Swadeshi movement on social media, then you had the BT. Um, which are on the in that campaign. So I guess just the quantity of advertising money that's going versus the creativity and engineering of the campaign. I don't know. I guess the okay. I would say yeah, yeah, the no, weight I'm of the yeah. quantum is more than just the social engineering. No, yeah. Aspect. No, you you actually you, thank you for highlighting something that's really important, which is the whole other other sort of half of the equation here, which is that none of this is possible without a really uh, with, without a serious stock of funds for the BJP to deploy and it somehow it's come, it somehow acquired that over the course of this government uh, and become one of the richest political parties in the country it uh, according to its to the official figures declared to the EC the BJP um, received more in donations than the BJP received three times as three times the amount in donations as the next six largest political parties in India combined. So if you to look that look at that as, as a pie chart then you then then three quarters would be uh, BJP funding and the remaining quarter would be uh, would, would be divided largely between six national parties including the Congress. So that's just one kind of statistic there's a whole variety and I've written and, and made some videos about this as, as well. But yeah, understanding the kind of nexus between uh, between funding and the change in electoral funding laws and frankly what I think can only be described as, uh, as corruption um, in, in giving the BJP that, uh, that kind of advantage in resources, it's completely part of this picture as well.
Um, so we have many, many questions. Uh, let's start here and then we'll sort of move backwards. Yeah. I'm Vijaya Nagarajan. And I just wanted to, um, what I see in your talk and even in this issue is a kind of triple braid of like under-theorized discourse on freedom, you know, in terms of as it relates to under-theorized discourse on technology, mm -hmm. and an under-theorized discourse on privacy. And this is true in the U.S. or in Europe. Yeah. You know? And I just wonder, I, I'm working, I've been thinking a lot about the commons and the theories of the commons. And so I was just curious, like, would that analysis of the commons be helpful for you at this moment, or for anyone trying to theorize about this? Because we have Eleanor Ostrom, you know, won the Nobel Prize in terms of physical resources, but there's an under-theorization of the commons in terms of, uh, you know, telecommunications. Absolutely. And so I think it seems Absolutely. like if one could figure that out, it's like a big puzzle, Absolutely. a gigantic puzzle that you've presented in a way, terrifying. Yeah. Um, and you see the Modi-Trump marriage <laughs> in full display in the last two weeks. Um, and I never even thought of this whole under, you know, uh, online. So I just was curious if you played with that, if you if you've um, experimented yeah, with that. I haven't. I think that thinking about thinking about the uh, the the, dig the commons as 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 a as a metaphor for. Um, Digital ecosystem and the digital mm -hmm. media ecosystem, and and mm -hmm. and even the kind of the, the the kind of technical architecture of of yeah, yeah. electronic communications is um, is really useful because it's an enclosure that's under the guise of freedom. Absolutely, yeah. and it's yeah. an enclosure that is both that is both kind of legally now ma being mandated, but is all and it also involves private corporations yeah. and one particular private corporation. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I think that you can do a lot with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah please. Um, what do you foresee for 2024? We started talking about this, like, the wave in town for I think you know what I foresee for 2024. Well, I mean, in, in more ghastly or something. Well, if you want to get ghastly, I, I, uh, I don't want, I, I don't like sharing this kind of conjecture, conjecture because I don't want to depress anyone's political kind of, uh, uh, set, anyone's sense of hope or optimism, mm -hmm. but I, I don't personally um, expect that the opposition is going to be able to mount a meaningful challenge at the national level for a few, uh, for a few terms at least, and I think that we're going to need to see, we, we're going to see some contradictions and open up within the BJP and within the Sangh Parivar uh, before this machine kind of breaks down. Mm -hmm. So I have a question on precisely that point, but we'll come to that after two questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should I? No, no, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you. Um, when you say that the other kinds of analysis are fallacious or deceptive in some yeah. way, is it that this um, hidden hegemony pieces has an outsized, has had an outsized influence compared to the rest? Or is it just something that has, for whatever reason, evaded the attention of the media? And if so, why? Oh, okay. So, like, just to be clear, the, the what I'm calling the hid, hidden hegemony, uh, which is, as you call it, a thesis, is something that, that I that I have not encountered at all in the media. So, as far as uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are that, that there are versions of this of this exploration that are being that are happening in academic spaces, and uh, you know, and mm -hmm. but in the public sort of domain of uh, of the Indian media, I think this is completely absent. So what is present is is these other sort of uh, um, what I call fallacious explanations, which I think are frankly just uh, part of a big new lie because they tend to conceal um, they can tend to conceal the kind of structural remaking that's going on uh, in order to you know in, in, in it's a kind of medium is the message problem. Everyone is talking about the success of the message, uh, and mm -hmm. it's it's just very very apparent that the that 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 to focusing on that is is concealing that the kind of transformation of the medium. Does the EC have the kind of personnel 
with the kind of technical expertise to understand what's going on, quite apart from there being inadequate laws about government using its position unfairly, about transparency and financing and so forth. So there's a you know that whole question of the structure that ought to be. Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a crucial question, mm -hmm. and I think that it's one of the one of the few but obvious sort of yeah. forms of recourse that we that, that we can be talking about right now. Um, no, the EC doesn't have the resources to do that. You may have heard that this this year the, the they expanded their remit for the first time to include um, publicity and campaigning on social media, but uh, it was it was just very clear that the the, the EC partly because it's over centralized and. And, and everything was had to be referred to the Central Election Commission. Um, but the, e the EC was, frankly, completely inept at responding even, at, e e even to, to, to simpler uh, and more apparent violations of the code. So, and, uh, and, and, and then there was, there's, there's obviously, there are also signs of some kind of coercion and intimidation within the EC, so all of this is difficult. But mm -hmm. if they were to to be paying attention to this kind of uh, phenomenon, such as the way the Na Narendra Modi app is being distributed, I would think that the Election Commission would be actually be empowered to kind of I investigate that and, and put some checks on it. Okay, so question in the back, please, yeah. Um, I have a question around um, which communities do you think that in this analysis are the ones that are heavily engaging with this form of propaganda and information dispersion and which are, which if any communities are particularly resisting this? Um, so a lot of this happens um, in the shadows, to, to put it a bit dramatically, but um, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. My assumption would be that while the BJP has huge resources to deploy in uh, in this regard, they um, they the starting point w would be having the party and, and political consultancies identify constituencies, you know, just the range of constituencies that where the swing uh, was uh, was most required, and then identify the communities. Uh, where they could, which they could target in order to swing seats to the BJP, and I think that's what they did at various levels. So um, essentially, in UP and in West Bengal and in states that were heavily targeted, there are a, there are a couple of communities that are that, that were probably targeted on a on a seat by seat basis. Um, but I don't know exactly. I, I can't generalize about which ones those were. What's interesting and what uh, is you know kind of requires some alertness in, on the road ahead is that uh, with sufficient data um, you and and with sufficient automation of this process you can you can, you can target, target every community because essentially you're targeting every voter at that point or every voting household on the basis of their profile and you don't need to you don't need to choose one other than the other you know so this is the place where I have to finally break in and ask I, a question. Yeah, I do want to bring in Sahadev as well because he has something important. But you go go ahead, Arshi. Let me just let me just ask this question because we're on the topic of hegemony. So this is an interesting word, and let me ask you a historical question about no, this. No, please right? don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the, so the thoughts, historical yeah. question is this: um, is the question of you know so this idea of hidden hegemony, right? So I mean, some theorizations of hegemony think of hegemony as always hidden, right? right? And it's so never visible. Um, and always some mixture of consent and coercion, and you can clearly see that there's some new assemblage of consent and coercion that is taking place in this particular technological environment. But if you were to sort of histor historicize this, you know, let's say to 1914, right, in Jinnah, um, you could make the case that what Jinnah was sort of arguing against was precisely the fact that there was some kind of hegemonic apparatus of Hinduism and politics that was being assembled, that he sort of wanted to break from. Um, and then if you think about the Republic of India with its sort of veneer of secularism, deep or thin, however you want to describe it, from let's say, you know, 47 to the mid 90s. Um, that Republic, as we knew it, uh, we come from the same generation, was also 
crafting a hegemony that depended on a technological apparatus. So if you think about it, you know, Doordarshan and Akashvani were these incredible propaganda instruments at a time when nothing else was available until the sort of cable news revolution. And yet, despite its complete control of technological resources, that hegemonic structure collapsed fairly dramatically in the mid-90s. The same thing happened in the Soviet Union, where again, there was a very sophisticated control over methods of media production, targeting people who were, again, you might regard as naive or unsophisticated. Um, and then the forms or the places where the hegemonic structure collapsed were always unanticipatable and invisible. So given, given that reality, um, do you think, for what really is new here? Is it that you think that um, there's a new kind of hegemonic structure that is being built? Is it qualitatively different? Is it resistant to collapse in ways that is formerly impossible? Is this going to be more durable or long lasting? Or is this really more of the same and what we're seeing is you know, the perfect storm of a certain kind of politics post-1945 that is globally shifting form continuously? Um, and this is just the latest iteration of that shift. Okay, well, that's, that, thank you for that. That's a, very, that's a fantastic question and a good challenge. Uh, about the, the form of hegemony that India has previously ex, uh, experienced, I forget which political scientists kind of gave us this formulation. I'm sure someone can jump in here and help me. But uh, this a, uh, a very standard f formulation of Indian electoral history has it that uh, India had a Congress hegemony between 1951 and 1967. Congress, oh, but or maybe 77. Congress dominance between 67 and 89, and then the sort of, uh, then there's another phrase that described the kind of tumult of multi-party uh, competition thereafter. Uh, some kind of canonical sort of paper. So I think the kind of, so I would not describe the whole course from the 1940s to the 1990s as, as, as any form of party hegemony, but the but forties but the forties to the sixties has been well described as as a time of hegemony and it was one in which the only successful challenge emerged after the Congress party actually cracked up internally. Um, so to the to the point about how it's different from the nineteen nineties, I don't think that, that by the time the Correct me? Are you going to correct me? I mean, I only half heard what you were saying. Oh, sorry. The one distinction I do see is the pollution of industry and politicians, government. So it's, it's true that that's that existed before it's as well. It's distinctive here. I could be mistaken. But it really is quite stunning how the reliance group, the GEO, and the government seem to be colluding with each other and bring about this kind of yeah, so it's it's it. I think that is very distinct. I think it's I think it's remarkable, mm -hmm. and that's the part that uh, caused me to introduce the word hidden. I think I'm I'm glad to have you point out that that <coughs> maybe hegemony is always hidden, and it's always needs to, especially in uh, electoral democracy, it's always kind of being concealed beneath the uh, uh, beneath the veneer of the process of elections. Um, I think the reason that I gravitated towards that word is that is that I'm is that my reference points and also because this is my field uh, are what's in the what's what's in the news media and within the news media it is uh, um, my starting point is that like is it is it is it the the this the kind of the iceberg is, I mean, we, we're not appreciating that we're not seeing the kind of iceberg of, of factors. We're only seeing, we're, we're barely seeing the tip. Um, and therefore, uh, yeah. I don't know, this, 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 is, something, this is something worth, worth my thinking yeah. further about. But what's hidden is, um, is, that, is that the technological apparatus which has existed before, as you pointed out, there were, at every stage there's been a technology, at every stage there's been some degree of collusion between the, the ruling establishment and 
and you know the, the in an industry, but um, the the technological apparatus is changing and transforming at a rate that uh, that is being put to the service of of, of hegemony, and I don't think that we understand. Um, I don't know if that rate of change has always been the case before. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, yeah, no. simply in the, in, the dis in the time between 2014 and 2019, I think that the, the <coughs> technology and underlying the change in, um, in political call and response has, been, has changed kind of so much. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely, and I think those are all very interesting points. I just want to add very quickly that I think we, th your talk also invites us to think about what is hegemonic, right, and whether the yeah. site of the hegemonic authority should be seen as a political party or an individual right. or a set of ideas or a set of networks or, you know, whatever, which I think the answer is not obvious, and I think that right. one of the wonderful things that your talk does is it really expands our canvas for thinking about where precisely hegemonic power is situated and moving mm -hmm. in the field, in this very complex field of the country. So I think we have time for one last question, um, and I'm going to just give that to Professor Saha in the back. Can, can I, yeah, can, or, can, sorry, can, can I, I both of you? Go ahead, I'll ask, well, we can talk about that. respond to yeah. that yeah, okay. question, though, because I'm, I'm interested in this question, but I was gonna, I was gonna suggest that maybe what Abhishek is prodding you to think about the hegemonism of hegemony might reveal in your analysis is, is this, it is that, there's so much anxiety around the particularity of Modi, right. right? And the particularity of of the BJP right now, and the and the kind of historical contingency of this moment. And I think what you're pointing to, and what I'm suggesting is there's a kind of a trend towards an apparatus of which there have been proximate apparatuses in the past that does a kind of work regardless of who is at the helm. Yeah. And the kind of um, lack of transparency, the ways in which uh, these things seem to be now inextricable from aspects of what used to seem so personal to one's life, right? Uh, communication, um, education, are now embedded in a way that they weren't before. So part of what you're showing us is it's not Modi to fear, it's more the kind of deep integration of these systems right. into the lives of 1.3 billion people. Right. Yeah, that's, I think that's perfectly said, and I'm going to transcribe that uh, <laughs> and then say it in my next talk. And to connect that to what uh, Jaydev was, 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 was gesturing at earlier, which is that there are analogies here to the other internet, which is the Internet of the People's Republic of China, I think that's kind of an essential reference point, and it's probably a, a kind of motivating reference point for the people who are involved in doing in making some of these design decisions. Because if what I'm kind of centrally identifying is that you can have Cambridge Analytica without Facebook, and you can and you can have uh, your sort of uh, you can sort of base your hegemony on direct verticals of communication that, that don't have the interference of foreign, corporate, for-profit uh, platforms, uh, then in a, se in, a, in a sense, what we're looking at is, uh, is an internet that looks more like the internet of China than the internet of, which is one that's nationalized um, and, uh, and, and has used a, very cleverly used, um, a rhetoric that we're now seeing that I'm that I'm beginning to hear in India of digital colonialism, which is that we shouldn't be paying all of these royalties on our data to Silicon Valley, uh, and that we should be nationalizing our, our our own internet and its kind of properties. And of course, that may be true and is not a terrible argument, but is one that's going to help create one that's going to help create a hegemony of. Of of, uh, of whoever it is that's in power right now. Yeah. I mean, so I, I'm going to just reserve the last note as the historian of uh, older time in the Republic of India to simply say that I think one of the stunning things about looking at Indian history as opposed to the history of, say, China, in some ways, is that dynasties in India last very short periods of time. <laughs> Thank you for, for adding that. You know, and so, <laughs> so, so, so structures, so hegemonic structures in India are very powerful, 
but they also tend to break with extreme rapidity and are always being replaced. So, you know, there's much to look forward to. Um, and on that note, I'd like to end. But, you know, please stick around. We have wine, we have food, uh, we have conversations available. So please come and join me and let's have a longer chat with Rahu after we give him a big hand. Thank you.